Right. Okay, so um, in the previous uh, lectures, we have um, discussed uh, theoretically the um, anomaly, anomaly in global symmetries like the chiral symmetry and in um, uh, gauge theories. And we've seen that um, the uh, global anomaly is a physical thing. We said that it's a physical thing. Uh, whereas the gauge anomaly, it's unphysical, so must vanish. Um, today, we're going to concentrate on the physical applications of these uh, anomalies. Um, the physical application of uh, the um, first, the physical application of uh, the global symmetry, uh, specifically the pi and decay and the uh, Tufts so UVIR anomaly matching conditions. And then um, the applications of the gauge anomaly, specifically anomaly cancellation in models and in the standard model. All right, so let's start with, um, with pi and decay. The pion, so this is the most physical application of uh, anomalies. So the neutral pion, so pions, as you know, um, come in three um, three types. Um, they are um, they be, they are um, acted on by the group SU two. So uh, we can. The physical states are usually uh, defined as p plus p minus and pi zero. So p plus p minus are electromagnetically charged with charge plus minus one, and pi zero is uh, electromagnetically neutral. And uh, um, but pi zero, whereas pi plus and pi minus cannot decay, pi zero can decay into two photons. So the Decay we're interested in it is pi zero going to gamma gamma. Um, <clears throat> so basically, the reason this can happen is because the pions are uh, related to the divergence of um, divergence of the. Uh, axial vector current. Axial vector current, remember, uh, means uh, psi bar um, Ta, which in this case, the generators of the symmetry, in this case, uh, the, the Pauli matrices over 2, sigma A over 2, are the generators of SU2 for the pi plus, pi minus, pi zero. And um, uh, gamma 5, gamma, uh, psi mu. So this is uh, the uh, chiral vector current. And um, acting with its divergence, I mean, it has to be with its divergence because in this case, we get rid of the uh, Lorentz vector and we're left only with the SU2 vector, which as we said, is um, um, decomposed into pi zero plus pi, uh, plus pi plus pi minus. So more precisely then, in quark models, uh, the pions are, um, like all mesons, are objects of the type uh, anti-quark quark. So the quark, um, um, the quark uh, uh, color index is uh, summed over. And we're left only with some global index. And uh, <clears throat> and then what we have is um, what we have is, as we said, that uh, so by by acting with uh, the derivative, we we use the um, we use the Dirac equation, um, and. Uh, and then we can reply, replace basically replace gamma mu d mu gamma mu with m cube. 
So we have uh, that the current is 2i and q, q bar gamma 5, sigma a over 2, the generator, gamma mu, q. However, uh, so, so this is in the quark models, but in the quark model, meaning um, if you want at uh, high energies in the UV. But in the IR, in the vacuum, we, as we said, we cannot think of having a fixed number of partons, like just one quark and one antiquark. We have to have a distribution functions for the partons instead of the hadrons because of the strong coupling, which is known as hadronization. And then, the, so given this fact, the claim is that the correct uh, hadronized equation is that the uh, derivative of the uh, of this um, uh, of this uh, uh, current uh, axial vector current hadronized is uh, um, is m pi squared, the pi and pi a, times a constant known as the, um, the constant f pi, known as the pi and de decay constant. Um, so this pi and decay constant can be independently measured from experiment. Um, but, um, but in some sense, if you want, you can also take the f pi as a take this relation as a definition for f pi. Um, so this relation is called the Pkak relation, meaning partially conserved axial vector current. Um, <clears throat> now, okay. So this relation would be correct for any pi a, except that we said that um, the um, pi plus, while, while pi plus, pi minus uh, cannot decay, pi zero does decay. Um, so correspondingly, you know, so the index plus minus and zero corresponds to the index on the Pauli matrices. So um, we can have sigma plus, sigma minus, and pi zero means sigma three, right? So in that case, um, in that case, we said that pi zero can decay into gamma gamma. But how can it decay? Well, it decays via this anomaly. So the point is, this divergence of the current has an anomaly, which means in, in four dimensions that there's a triangle with the anomaly here, but the anomaly is proportional to pi, in this case, pi zero. And then at the other two um, um, vertices of the triangle, we have photons, a mu. Okay. So then, more precisely, what we have is d mu j mu five um, indices plus uh, global indices plus minus is f pi m pi squared pi pi plus, um, plus minus. But for with the index index three, the d mu j mu five with index three is the same thing, so f pi m pi squared pi 3 plus a constant times e squared over six pi, 16 pi squared epsilon mu nu rho sigma f mu nu f rho sigma. So this quantity without c um, is uh, the anomaly um, that we found for one, um, for one massless fermion. Um, so, um, <clears throat> so this, uh, so this is the anomalous contribution and this relation is correct to all orders in the strong coupling, but only to, um, 
uh, but only to first order in alpha. So that means uh, it's, uh, it's valid uh, for the full hadronized theory of QCD, for the full uh, hadronized theory under QCD, but uh, it's uh, only one loop in QED. QED in, in principle, if I, we go to higher loops, we could um, consider um, we can consider higher uh, loop corrections, and then we could uh, have um, we could we could have more than two photons, or reversely here more than different uh, correction. Now, so as I said, this if this C is put here. So we calculated for QED. So if we had one electron, then we would have uh, C equal one. This is the U1 Carler anomaly that we've calculated for one uh, fermion. But uh, instead, now in the loop, since this is a hadronic uh, uh, current, in the loop in here, we have quarks. Quarks are also coupled to photons. <coughs> <clears throat> so, um, so for quarks in the loops, we have C equal to the number of colors of a six. So why is that? Well, let's see that pi zero is, has this TA in here, which is um, the, the Pauli matrix with index three over two. So this Pauli matrix three is uh, one minus one over the diagonal. And then Psi um, <clears throat> under this SU2 uh, has also in this, I mean, it, there's a up uh, and a down, up quark and a down quark, all of them with, um, with um, uh, color indices. So then C, you see, C corresponds to trace of this tau three over two, but with the charge Q of the electrons, Q squared over two. Now the charge of up is two thirds and the charge of down is minus one third. So, um, so then uh, we have here, uh, and, and there's, a, there's also a trace of a number of colors which gives NC. And then, so I have NC over these two, and then one times two thirds squared minus one times minus one third squared, which gives NC over six. Right. So the, the, the charge Q appears here because uh, of photons, I mean, the vertex of the quarks with the photon uh, in, uh, corresponds to the, the charge. So before we had uh, E because that was the charge of the electron, but now we have uh, Q times E, which is the charge of the quark. <clears throat> um, so let's consider the, the limit where the pion is massless is consistent because the pion is anyway uh, the lightest uh, um, lightest um, state in QCD by approximately an order of magnitude. So um, the well, I forget the exact number. I'm sorry. I think it's uh, 140. Um, uh, 140 MeV um, for uh, for the pion, something like this. Well, of the order of 100, and then the next is of the order of a thousand. So, um, so it's it's really it's really the lightest uh, state um, by far. Um, <clears throat> now we can consider 
uh, the matrix element of this uh, current for pi zero, and so j mu a three, in between a photon st a state with two photons, right? And so a state with two photons and this and the vacuum. So let's consider this as a state um, a vacuum, uh, the, the matrix element between this and the vacuum. Now, um, this matrix ele element, so we can insert in here, we can insert a complete, uh, a complete uh, set of states, of QCD states, of states uh, in the vacuum, uh, of uh, quark states in the vacuum, I should say. And uh, as we said, the lightest by far is the pion. So the biggest contribution then would be from, ah, from this, um, from this uh, pi pi uh, contribution. So then we'd have all the other uh, mesons, uh, pi, well, <laughs> Yeah, I forget which is the, the next uh, meson in, in mass, but um, um, yeah, anyway, so let's, let's call this state, other states V and V and so on. So there'll be other, um, other states. Now, on the other hand, the, um, matrix element of the pion with uh, the vacuum, uh, um, so the matrix, ma matrix element of the pion uh, operator between the pion and the vacuum, which is just a normalization, in other words, right? I mean, the pion uh, operator acting on the vacuum creates a pion, so this is normalization for a pion. Uh, is uh, one over square root two omega um, IQ, which is the relativistic wave function normalization. Um, <clears throat> uh, but then, if we look in the um, if we look in the uh, CAC relation, so we have here the pi on pi zero, and um, uh, considering that the anomaly itself has no uh, matrix element between a pion and the vacuum, we can relate the this matrix element with the matrix element of d mu j mu five uh, component three, and then. Um, Uh, yeah, so we replaced pi zero. So in other words, we can replace pi zero in here with k, uh, q mu derivative in momentum space, j mu divided by f pi and pi squared. And then all, we also remember that q mu squared is m pi squared. Um, so um, Uh, yeah, so this allows us to, well, with the understanding then that this J mu should be also proportional to Q mu, then uh, such that, Q, you know, we have Q mu squared here um, giving uh, M pi squared, then the, the matrix element of the pi zero, uh, from the matrix element of the pi zero, we, we deduce the matrix element of the current itself, which should be proportional to Q mu. So I've, I've canceled them pi squared because I've uh, said that J mu is proportional to Q mu. Um, so Q mu F pi um, uh, over a square root two omega Q. 
But now let's consider uh, the Cox relation in between the two photon state and the vacuum. <clears throat> so the Cox relation, this one, in between the fo two photon state and the vacuum. This is the one that we're interested in. And consider then the right hand side. Um, <clears throat> Um, so we have uh, so we have this anomalous uh, part in between uh, two photons and the vacuum, and um, and then uh, the the pion between two photons and a vacuum gives zero because the pion operator. Create, uh, on the vacuum creates a pion state, a pion state, um, pion state uh, is orthogonal to the two photon states. So then we're left with the uh, anomalous part in between the two photon state and the vacuum. Um, so C, as we saw, is an NC over a six. Then we have this uh, anomaly part. Uh, e squared over 16 pi squared epsilon ff between the two photon and zero. And what does that mean? Well, <clears throat> you see the two photons, there's one photon with epsilon one, one photon and momentum p1, one photon with, uh, with uh, polarization epsilon two and momentum p2. But, um, <clears throat> But f mu nu, you know, under anti-symmetry, you can replace this by saying, well, there's, there's a factor of two from undone the two on, uh, two terms, and then uh, epsilon, uh, and then p mu for the derivative in momentum space, and um, and um, epsilon nu for the um, for the polarization. Then one f is corresponds to this one, and then the other f corresponds to uh, two. So then I have epsilon mu one, uh, p one rho, epsilon mu two, p two sigma. And um, there's also a factor of two because I can act with either one of the f's um, and uh, get um, either one of the s identify with one and then the other one identify with two. So then all in all I have a fa factor of eight. So eight epsilon mu nu rho sigma, then epsilon one, p one, epsilon two, p two. I can put it in this form. All right. Okay. Yeah. So here I, I, I wrote this uh, relation f axiom on, on a one state gives this. Okay. Then also remembering that epsilon uh, e squared over two pi squared is um, uh, is two alpha over pi. Alpha is uh, e squared over four pi. Um, I write this in terms. I, I write so the the left um, left hand side of the character relation in between the two photon state and the vacuum is. Two photon state, uh, d mu j mu, zero, and then the right hand side we've calculated it. So, so two photon state zero, d mu j mu three, is this thing, and then we've replaced uh, e squared over two pi squared with two alpha over pi, and we get this coefficient here with alpha over pi and c over three. Uh, epsilon minor sigma, epsilon one, epsilon two, p one, p two. All right. <clears throat> um, so then, uh, um, so then, then we have this 
uh, relation. We have this relation, and we saw that uh, that uh, the um, that the, the the biggest contribution then is from the pion. So um, the Um, uh, two photon state uh, two photon state between the two photon state the vacuum with um, with d mu j mu we have um, this um, this um, uh, this normalization, so this normalization uh, goes here. Ah. This normalization goes here, and when, then we're left with the uh, uh, epsilon one, uh, the two photon state versus the uh, versus the pion, and. Uh, So the two photon state versus the pion then is equal to uh, this thing, which we've, we've calculated. So, so two photon state versus the pion, whilst we get rid of this normalization, is the two photon state versus the mu j mu zero, and um, and then this we've calculated here. So we get that the amplitude for pi going to gamma gamma, which is this one is uh, is equal to this alpha of pi and c over three one over f pi that comes from the normalization which normalization from this normalization which we've used uh, here um, uh, epsilon. Uh, epsilon minor sigma, epsilon one, epsilon two, p p one, p two. <clears throat> All right. Uh, that, so this is the amplitude, and then we've calculated um, what is the rate of decay given an amplitude for decay. So the amplitude is. Um, we calculated it in, in uh, part one of the course, here T1. So the amplitude for decay, sorry, the probability for decay, rate of decay, is one over two m pi integrals, the, the integrals over the momenta uh, P1, P2, and sum of polarization of the amplitude squared and uh, the delta function. <clears throat> 2 pi to the 4 delta 4 q minus p1 minus p2. Okay, so now we substitute this amplitude in here. Um, and uh, and then we do a calculation that um, well, it's not reproduced here, but you know it's it's easy to do. And the result is that the rate of decay for pi I'm going to gamma gamma is this formula so on a 16 pi a 16 4 pi then alpha of pi nc over 3 1 over n pi squared times n pi cubed so uh, somebody wants to get in no um and then um uh, so, so we, as we as we see, this is proportional to alpha uh, to alpha square that we uh, understood. Uh, alpha was, is the coupling to uh, to a photon in the in the transition amplitude in the transition uh, rate. Sorry. And uh, but well, we also have this n c over three uh, squared. 
And since we, we can test experimentally to a very high degree of uh, precision um, this formula, we can calculate that uh, we can uh, confirm that NC is equal to 3. So this is yet another test for uh, having three number of colors. All right. Uh, the second application, the second application of um, of the anomaly to um, um, to um, uh, to physical um, um, to, uh, to physics to to physical experiments is the non-conservation of baryon number in electroweak theory. So these are, by the way, these are this, there are three. Um, I didn't say that there are three um, classic tests of the anomaly. So one is by going to gamma gamma. The second is non-conservation of baryon number. And the third is the so-called U1 problem. <clears throat> now. Um, these next two ones will, will seem somewhat uh, obvious after we know that there's an anomaly. This is more quantitative. The next two ones are, um, well, more qualitative. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so this is, so we're talking about non-conservation of baryon number in the standard model. So the standard model uh, has a gauge group SU3 colors, and then electroweak SU2 cross U1 uh, hypercharge. SU2 cross U1 hypercharge is broken to the U1 electromagnetic, um, which is a combination of the U1 hypercharge and the uh, uh, U1 including the, this SU2. Um, <clears throat> so let's describe the fermion field content of the standard model. We have um, we have uh, lepton, meaning things like electron and neutrino. Um, so electron, neutrino, electron. Um, uh, muon and uh, uh, muon neutrino and tau and tau neutrino. These are the um, these are the the doublets, the SU2 doublets. They are doublets under um, this SU2, and they're also left-handed, so we call them L. And as we see, as we said, these are uh, written as muon. Um, neutrino time and then um, and then uh, well we write here EL but by EL we mean the various uh, uh, various fields so uh, E left and um, and mu left and uh, tau left and then we also have um, the quarks, which are also doublets on the SU2, and SU, but the doublets are up down, uh, um, up down, uh, charm strange. Um, so, sorry, this is written. Yeah, no, up, up down, uh, charm strange, strange charm, charm, charm strange. Uh, I forgot. And, top and bottom. Um, and, uh, and But together we'll write them like this. So Q left is up left, down left. And the left, of course, means uh, projection with the left projector, 1 minus gamma 5 over 2. And right means projection with the, um, with the right projector, 1 plus gamma 5 over 2. So, as I said, here we, we considered only the first uh, gen so-called generation, right, of uh, fermions. 
electron muon electron uh, neutrino uh, electron neutrino and up down but uh, the same is true for all the for the the three um, um, generations so we can think of this as also a sum over uh, as a matrix in generation space <clears throat> Therefore, um, uh, oh, and uh, um, so the electron has a right-handed uh, part. So we write R, that the right, so, so left is a doublet, but right is a singlet that is only the right part of the electron or muon or tau. Um, but there's no uh, right part of neutrino. Um, a right part of neutrino would be a singlet under SU2. And uh, um, it would be something extra. It's the simplest expansion of the standard model to have a right-handed neutrino added in, but as a, as a singlet, not so uh, then the, the, for the standard model, the lepton part is the right part, um, which is just this electron, uh, the, the um, right, hand, right hand projection of the electron part uh, with uh, coupling to uh, to uh, the hypercharged gay field that I've called Binu. And then the left-hand uh, part is with the minimal coupling to the full uh, SU2 cross uh, U1. So A mu A is SU2, so that's why it's um, contracted with sigma A over 2, which is the generator of SU2. And uh, and then you have again the coupling to B mu, the hypercharge. Just that the lepton part has a charge uh, a half. Hence um, here I put the half, whereas here I, I have one. Um, and the quark part is so. Again, the left part and the right part um, with the so the left part is a doublet under SU two, so it couples to the SU two gauge field, and it couples to um, the so you have a mu a times sigma a over 2, which is the generator of SU2. But then it also couples to um, to the U1 of hypercharge um, with the same one half. But uh, now I also I also need to add a hypercharge, extra hypercharge YL. And here, Y right, uh, Y, yeah, Y right. So, um, so a, a quark has uh, yeah all right. So um, so if you look at this uh, action, then you consider what happens for um, for uh, physical uh, states. Physical states. Um, means uh, hadrons and mesons. This is the state. These are the states in the vacuum. Now, in the specifically in the vacuum, what we found is are baryons, such that so, I mean the simplest baryons being um, uh, being the proton and the neutron. Baryons means uh, states which have three quarks. Q Q Q. Um, and then 
we also have lepton. Um, we also have leptons, the electrons and neutrons, uh, neutrinos. Sorry, are also physical states. So uh, you can consider, uh, you can define a baron number B, which counts how many barons you have, and the lepton number L, which counts how many leptons you have. You can actually consider independent lepton numbers for each generation, lambda uh, L, E, L mu, and L tau. But these are just approximate symmetries, whereas B and L, if you look at this action, you can figure out that B and L are actually uh, symmetries of this action. That's what the reason is. Um, so, sorry. And then you can you can define the charge of one baryon to be one. And as a result, you have to define the charge of uh, one quark, the baryon number of one quark, to be one third. But on the other hand, the leptons by themselves are physical states, so you can define the lepton number of the lepton to be one. So these are uh, classical symmetries. B and L are classical symmetries of the standard, standard model. However, in the standard model, we've seen that we have chiral uh, fermions. So we have... Um, independent uh, actions for left and right, okay? We write independent actions for left and right. And, um, um, so, and then that means that there would be anomalies. So B and L, L will be, in, uh, in principle, anomalies. We have an abelian or singlet anomaly in this non-abelian theory of SU3 cross SU2 cross U1. So the, the anomaly of this baryon number, so D mu, J mu baryon, the current baryon current, uh, D mu, J mu, B, is, um, is proportional to what? Well, um, so the baryons, uh, the variants are made by the quarks, okay? And the quarks um, um, the quarks are um, um, coupled to, well, Uh, I'm sorry, I, yeah, I, I, I screwed up. I should have uh, put the, the um, coupling to uh, SU3, right? To, um, to the color, uh, color field. So I should, I should have put, I wonder if I corrected it. No, I didn't correct. Anyway, I should have corrected also uh, the coupling to SU3 uh, in both left and right uh, quarks. Um, um, So, did I say this in uh, the notes? I don't think I did say. Anyway, so we have um, we have an abelian anomaly in the non-abelian theory. Uh, where I um, 
I couple, so I have at one, uh, I have a triangle with one vertex being this D mu G mu B and the other vertex vertices being um, the, um, being the SU3 field. Uh, so the, the, the color field. Um, and then uh, correspondingly, I have G, which is the, uh, oh, sorry. No, I, um, sorry, I, no, uh, so, sorry, the, the, um, the, SU3, the color field uh, couples in the same way. That's the point that this uh, SU3 couples in the, in the same uh, way to both left and right. Uh, so the anomaly for it will cancel. Also, I think uh, there's a safe group for it. Yeah, so there's only an anomaly. Yeah, so there's only an anomaly for SU2. Uh, because SU2 couples, as we see, only to the left part, but not to the right part. So, so the, the corresponding uh, field, so the, the photon, quote unquote, uh, is uh, U1, in, I mean, is the abelian part uh, inside um, the SU2 gauge field. So I have trace of F minu, F tilde minu, where F minu is. Uh, the SU2 um, gauge uh, gauge field, the gauge field strength. Um, and then G squared over 16 pi squared, which is the coefficient that we've uh, found. But then inside this uh, triangle runs any types of quark. And so I have to sum also over the generation of generations of quarks. There are three generations, as we said. Um, up, down, charm, strange, and top, bottom are three generations. Um, <clears throat> now let's integrate over space. So over, uh, so this integrated over d3x and integrated over dt. Over d3x, I integrate over the whole space and over dt between some t1 and t2. So this, in other words, is integrate, integrate, uh, integral of d4x for some uh, uh, manifold of d mu j mu. But this is, uh, this is then integral to over d3x of j0 so in the integral of d, uh, dt is with dt, d0, j0. So that gives integral d, d3x of j0 uh, baron between the times t1 and t2. But integral d3x of j0, b, is the baron number. So this is the baron charge density integrated over space gives uh, charge. So the baryon number or charge uh, at time uh, T2 minus time T1. So that means that B at time T2 minus B of time T1 is the integral over this time between T1 and T2 and over uh, space of this object. So there's this constant and then trace F mu nu, F tilde mu nu. But there is a non-trivial field configuration called an instanton that obeys the, um, that, obe that if Vic rotated to Euclidean space, obeys the condition that F mu nu equal to F tilde mu nu. Uh, and uh, and we, which means that for them, um, for this instanton in Euclidean space, since f minu is equal to f tilde minu, this quantity, g squared over 16 pi squared trace integral of a trace f minu f minu, 
g squared over 4 pi squared times 1 over 4 integral d 4x trace f minus uh, squared, which is just the action, OK? Euclidean action. And um, so Uh, so since the baryon number is uh, is an integer, you can figure out that this thing has also to be an integer. I mean, and then generation is also an integer, that which can be put to one. And which, which you can figure out that so the, the difference of two integers is an integer. So this should be an integer, and this integer is called the instanton number. Um, and is the number of these field configurations called the instantons. And from this calculation, we have seen that this Euclidean action, this Euclidean action is 4 pi squared times n over g squared. Right? <clears throat> and then, um, and then the difference in baryon number is number of generations times this instanton number. All right. So the difference in the baryon number is defined by the instanton number. On the other hand, we know that the transition, we know from quantum mechanics that the transition probability um, the transition probability between two states, so the transition between um, baron number B at uh, T1 and baron number B at T2, I mean, B prime at T2, um, is, this is written as a, in quantum mechanics, as a path integral. And uh, the, the path integral can then can be approximated with um, its, um, um, its saddle point, its value at the saddle point. So Euclidean action has a minimum. And then quantum fluctuations are, corresponds to the variations from this minimum. But at the first order level, in the quantum mechanics level, this corresponds to just E minus Euclidean action. <clears throat> so, uh, considering this uh, fact, we have that uh, SE is 4 pi squared over G squared N. So here I have E mod to the minus 4 pi over G squared times N. But then G squared um, over uh, g squared over pi is alpha weak, and then alpha weak in uh, in our vacuum is about one over thirty. So correspondingly, this value, if I, if I put n equal to one, right, which is the 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 minimum value of s, which is the maximum value of e minus s. Um, is uh, 30. So then I have e to minus 4 pi times 30. Now pi times 3 is about 10. So this is e about e to minus uh, 400. Right? e to minus 400 in the, is an absurdly low number. So uh, this is this transition probability between two different uh, baryon numbers is about the lifetime of the universe, corresponds to about the lifetime of the universe to, to transition. However, so that means that the baryon number is completely uh, conserved within uh, our, um, within our uh, universe. Uh, within the standard model, uh, this is important to, to realize. So, uh, so in particular, people are looking at um, at say grand unified theories, which are 
extensions of the standard model in which you can have a, a barren number transition. In particular, you can have a proton decay. Uh, and then you can uh, you can test against the experiment, but people have not found yet such proton decay, so barren number is still conserved in our universe, in, in our vacuum universe. However, if you think back uh, at the Big Bang, at the Bing, near the Big Bang, um, the, the temperature was extremely high. And then uh, when temperature is, corresponds, roughly speaking, to energy, it's very high. And then uh, the coupling um, is, sorry, uh, no, that's, well. Um, well, no, doesn't, it's not the same as energy, but anyway, uh, at uh, very high energy, um, we can have uh, a very high coupling. Um, at very high temperature, we can have a very high coupling. And so the probability of transition becomes of the order of one or so. So if I, well, or anyway, alpha over four pi, um, uh, becomes of the order of one. So that means that the, if the, tran the baron number, um, the, the transition between two different baron numbers is of order one, that means uh, that the baryon um, number would uh, be uh, equalized to zero between baron and anti-baryon like between proton and antiproton and um and uh, and uh, um and as a result the baryon number will be um zero so uh, an equal number of baryons and antibaryons however in our universe we certainly observe um uh, a net baryon number with we, we exist, we have, we're made of protons and electrons. So protons are bar baryons, but not antibaryons, um, which means that the initial stages of the Big Bang, there was already a baryon asymmetry. The question is how, is, how is it possible for that baryon asymmetry to, to, uh, to be um, preserved since, as we just saw at high energy, at high temperature, excuse me, um, there's a transition that wipes out their number. Um, so this is a very important question in theoretical physics, one that uh, has various possible mechanisms, but, um, um, but which one of them is correct, we don't know yet. Um, however, Sakharov in the 1980s already enumerated some necessary conditions to create a barren asymmetry, um, but uh, for the moment we haven't found a, a perfect model. Okay, so uh, to to summarize, uh, we've seen that the anomaly um, implies a, a non-conservation of barren number, but um, in our universe, but uh, um, at high temperature, so that's why at, in, that's why we. Um, but uh, this barren number non-conservation is is very small, um, so that's why the, the um, in our vacuum we have um, we have conservation, whereas at high temperature, we have non-conservation of the barrier number. All right, um, the Yuan problem. That's the third uh, classical uh, application of um, the anomaly. We'll not explain some, some details, uh, because there's also some information that I'll give uh, later on 
uh, in a few after a few more lectures. But um, I will just sketch it. So we will see, in actually in the last lecture of the course, that there is an effective symmetry um, SU to left cross SU to right. Uh, a, a global effective symmetry, S to left uh, cross S to right, that corresponds to the near masslessness of the up and up down quark. So the, we we don't we cannot since, since the quarks are nearly massless and and are inside a proton, which is uh, extremely quantum, so adds up a lot of mass. Uh, we cannot actually measure with precision the mass of the up and down, but we do know that is extremely low. Um, so it's, it's anyway much smaller than the masses of uh, charm bottom and top, which are heavy, but even uh, much smaller than S, which is kind of intermediate. The strange quark is, uh, has an inter intermediate mass. So, then we can consider an approximate symmetry uh, when the mass of u, u and d is considered to zero. Now, effective global symmetry is to left cross is to right. Um, this is spontaneously broken to a diagonal SU2. Um, again, I, details that I cannot explain yet. Um, but, uh, and also, when, whenever we spontaneously break a, sym break a symmetry, there is a so-called Golson boson appearing. Uh, Golson boson is a massless scalar associated with the broken symmetry. So in this case, I would break an SU2, sorry, an SU2 cross SU2 to another SU2, to a diagonal SU2. So we're left with an SU2 worth of Golson bosons means three, for three generators, three Gaussian bosons. Um, and in SC2, in, uh, QC, in real QCD, as I said, the masses of up and down are uh, nearly zero, but not zero. So SC2 left cross SC2 right is approximate. And then we have an approximate Gaussian boson. Um, so the Gaussian boson is, is a massless scalar, but the near approximate Golson bosons is a nearly massless scalar. And th there's an SU2 worth of them, or three, that uh, corresponds to the three pions. So the three pions are indeed, as I said, have indeed masses much smaller than the masses of the other states in QCD. So they are nearly massless. Um, so the so the three pions then corresponds to the three broken generators. However, so I said there's this SU2 cross SU2. However, uh, the actual uh, symmetry of the QCD Lagrangian, considering a generic number of flavors, in this case I considered two up and down, Gen generic number of massless flavors, here I considered up and down as approximately massless, is not SU2 cross SU2, but it's actually U, uh, U2 cross U2, or generalizing UNF2 cross UNF. And these would, this would, um, so I said one is left, one is right, meaning one acts from the left, one acts from the right. Um, but, uh, sorry, one acts on the left part, one acts on the right, right part. So, um, uh, so the action then would be, the action of this U2, UN cross UN would be as E to the I alpha A TA, TA being generators of UNF. And the other one is with uh, TA times gamma five. So there's a, also an action of gamma five on psi. Um, 
But as we see, we, as we said, uh, we, we just said, we observe just SU2 cross SU2, right? So the difference in this from the observed one and the theoretical one is a U1 cross U1. Uh, one of the U1s, um, you can think of it as trace of UNF, um, or, or the element one inside TA, um, is, uh, acts as psi going to e to the alpha, alpha psi. So that's, so, and this is a global symmetry, global U1. Uh, rotating, uh, acting uh, on a, on a, on the fermions, but that on, on the quarks, but that's just hadron number, or, or or baryon numbers if you want, which is conserved. But then there is uh, the other one, uh, the other one which is which acts with gamma five. In, uh, upstairs. So there's a chiral symmetry, right? That's what we define as a U1 chiral symmetry. And uh, before the anomaly, people thought, well, okay, there's this symmetry that we sh this is there, but we don't observe the corresponding uh, Goldstone boson. So why is that? So that was called the U1 problem. But now we don't, we know that uh, the symmetry is actually broken. It's not exact. It's broken by the chiral anomaly. So that's why there's no uh, Goldstone, massless Goldstone boson corresponding to uh, to this chiral symmetry. Okay. So that was um, that was the U1 problem. <clears throat> okay. So these were these three were the classic. Uh, Appli uh, applications of the chiro of the um, global symmetry to physics. Now, uh, let's turn to a more theoretical application um, known as the uh, UVIR anomaly matching condition uh, found by uh, Toft. This is a very useful, um, uh, useful uh, application in model building, or or in model building or in um, phenomenology, um, and uh, it, it's a very simple condition, a theorem, in fact, we'll, 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 which will prove. Uh, uh, shortly, is that simply put that the, the uh, um, uh, anomaly is independent of the energy scale. So anomaly of a physical system is independent of the energy scale. So in particular, we can say that the anomaly in the UV at high energies is equal to the anomaly in the IR at low energies. Um, <clears throat> so this is useful because we have the so-called effective field theory approach uh, started by Wilson that I'll describe later on. The, and this one states that for a given um, energy range, we can describe the theory in terms of some, some fields without really worrying if the fields are really fundamental as long as we introduce all the possible terms in the Lagrangian that are, um, that are uh, consistent with the symmetries. Um, even though, in principle, these ex all possible terms will be, um, non will be not non-renormalizable. Um, so the point of this is that we don't, the non-renormalizable, non -renormal my liability doesn't, um, it's only important if we um, care to, uh, if you ha have, want to have a theory defined at all possible scales, but if we are only looking for a theory in between some scales, then um, we can write uh, uh, 
non-normalizable uh, terms. So this point of view allows us to, for instance, to use the standard model without um, uh, worrying that there is um, that there is at least a Planck scale at which quantum gravity appears, but also maybe other some scales, some supersymmetry breaking scale or some grand unifying theory scale. So in principle, there are other uh, scales involved um, at which more degrees of freedom appears. But this allows us to, to think um, at, at which we think uh, what we think of as the fundamental degrees of freedom, freedom will, will change. But in that case, the um, anomaly matching conditions um, act as a check that we are truly using the correct degrees of freedom at a certain scale, given our knowledge about the degrees of freedom at a different scale. So, uh, Um, let's consider an example. Let's consider uh, a global U1 current and uh, that uh, in the IR we can say that we have some nearly massless fermion degrees of freedom. However, these may be composites. Um, <clears throat> Uh, for instance, in QCD, we could consider the neutrons and protons, which are composite of quarks, as degrees of freedom for energies higher than the proton and the neutrons, so higher than 1 GeV, but not too high as to consider uh, perturbative QCD. Um, all right, this is a very short possible, uh, in, pr in practice, this is a very, very short possible uh, energy uh, window, but uh, let's assume it. I mean, we're doing theory anyway, so we can say theoretically. On the other hand, in the UV, we can consider the fundamental degrees of freedom, like the quarks in the case of QCD. And so we can calculate uh, the, the anomaly in, uh, in the UV, where we have the quarks and the fundamental degrees of freedom. And then we can also consider the anomaly in the IR using the uh, protons and neutrons. And these two calculations should match. Okay. So what is the proof of this uh, uh, anomaly matching condition, or consistency condition of thought? Well, it's a very simple proof. You can so we, we consider a global symmetry, but we can just couple this global symmetry, this global U1, to a gauge field. That is to say, um, in theoretical terms, we gauge the symmetry. Then add some free chiral fermions that only couple to the gauge field, not to any other uh, field. So in such a way as to cancel the anomaly. We can, that we can only do. So there's some anomaly. And uh, we add the corresponding number of uh, massless catalog fermions to cancel that anomaly. Um, but uh, now we have um, um, yeah, so, so we, we need to cancel this uh, anomaly because we have a, now we have a local symmetry and as we see the consistency of the quantum theory of the, implies that there should be no local anomaly. But um, the anomaly cancellation um, for the lo local theory is independent of the energy scale. The, so it, it should, I mean, the anomaly is zero, it's anomaly, it's, uh, it's a consistent theory, but that should be consistent UV and IR. But then we turn off the gauge coupling, G goes to zero. We go back to the global case, plus some uh, completely free massless fermions. So these completely free massless fermions, they don't couple to anything, 
Therefore, for them, energy scale means nothing. So uh, the result is, so their anomaly is, I mean, so their, um, yeah, so they're, they're completely irrelevant to, this, to the problem. So uh, the result is then that for the uh, global anomaly, which used to be a, a local a part of the anomaly, um, a, a, a part of the local anomaly, sorry. Um, so this global anomaly is independent of scale. So we've proven uh, the matching conditions. And the interesting thing is, of course, that the anomaly, I, I haven't uh, really proven it to you, but I gave, gave, uh, um, gave some arguments. This is purely one loop. So it's easy to calculate uh, using some perturbative degrees of freedom a lot, uh, that we have at that particular energy scale. So the anomaly is easy to calculate for any uh, theory, it's just a one loop diagram. So, um, um, so this is a very powerful uh, thing that we, we calculate the um, anomaly at, for, 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 uh, at some energy scale that we know. And then uh, we propose that there's an effective field theory at some other energy scale. And uh, we, we calculate that it's anomaly and we see if it matches uh, the anomaly that we know. OK. So up to now, there was only global symmetry. And in this anomaly matching, we had to sort of uh, fake it in uh, to, to make it uh, uh, local. But now let's apply uh, really the, uh, let's uh, have a physical application of the cancellation of the local anomaly, of the lo local gauge anomaly. And specifically, let's consider for our uh, model, the standard model of particle physics. <clears throat> All right, so uh, we've seen that in four dimensions, the anomaly is proportional to this uh, invariant called DABC, the three indices. That's proportional to trace TA uh, times the anti-commutator of TB with TC. In turn, this DABC is proportional to the third Casimir of the group, C3G. <clears throat> So that means that if the Lie algebra of the group has no C3G, so DABC is zero, then there's no anomaly. Such a group, so this is a property of the group. This third Casimir is a property of the group. So such a group is called a safe group, meaning from it, whatever we do, we will get the uh, anomaly free theory gauge anomaly tree theory. Um, nearly all the classical groups are safe. So in the, um, the classical groups, I'll describe them here. Maybe you don't know them, but it doesn't matter. So there's the so-called BN series, which means the groups of uh, SO2 plus 2N plus 1. Um, the symplectic series, uh, CN or S SP uh, 2N and the uh, DN series or SO 2N. So here is uh, uh, even here is odd number. <clears throat> In particular, um, I, I, I single out SO 6. Uh, also, the exceptional groups. Uh, G2, F4, E6, E7, E8, all of the G these exceptional groups are safe. So I've en enumerated all of the uh, classical groups except the AN series, which is SUN. To, to where the SUN, all of these groups um, make, make up the, the classical groups. Um, 
But so also S U N for N greater or equal than three uh, is um, uh, unsafe. Okay. Um, and also, also SO6, because SO6 is uh, um, isometric to um, SU4. On the other hand, SU2 is, uh, is isometric to SO3, so it's safe. And also SO4 is um, isometric to SO3 cross SO3, uh, so it's also safe. So, um, so even if a group is unsafe, in some representation R, D A B C in some representation R, this is a trace in some representation. Um, so D A B C in a representation R, meaning trace in the representation R of this, might be zero. In this case, we say that representation is safe. Otherwise, uh, if we have um, if we have uh, an unsafe representation in, in an unsafe group, um, to cancel the anomaly, we need to combine several species of fermions, such as to cancel the anomaly. So, in the standard model, this is more re relevant uh, example that we have. We have the group SU three cross SU two cross U one. SU3 is unsafe, as we said, um, and it has unsafe representations. However, in the standard model, the anomaly is cancelled trivially because we have the same um, coupling for both left and right fermions. So we, we said that th this is a chiral anomaly for chiral fermions, but we have chiral left with a plus, anomaly coming with a plus, and chiral right with anomaly coming with a minus. So the anomaly cancels trivially because we have the same coupling to the left and right. So SU3 is uh, anomaly free, meaning having um, um, SU3 charged fields running in the loop. SU2 is a safe group, also because it's SO3 and also because it's uh, this condition, we said. Um, now, SU2 is safe, so uh, there is no anomaly with SU2 charge fields running in the loop, or in other words, with uh, SU2, so when in a triangle, with SU2 uh, uh, current divergence here and SU2 gauge fields here. However, that could be, so, so this is what we mean when we talk about the ABC. This, the ABC is the SU2, the anomaly in the in SU2 current uh, from SU2 gauge fields. But um, I can have an SU2, um, um, SU2 contributions, so from SU2 gauge fields, to the anomaly of some other gauge field, so the d mu j mu of some other uh, group. Uh, for SU3, couples uh, the same um, in the same way for left and right, so that's not it. Right? We already said that quarks running in the loop cancel the anomaly for IC3. So the only possibility to, is for U1. So I can have U1 uh, divergence, U1 divergence, uh, and contributions from SU2 and SU2. Right? That's one possibility. And then, of course, we can have the U1 anomaly. So U1 uh, divergence with contributions from U1 and U1. 
So the, we have this pure U1 anomaly and this mixed anomaly with the SU2. All right, so uh, together we'll write these conditions as sum over fermion representations, trace TA, um, where this is the generator that couples to the divergence of the current. And then um, this A wedge DA plus one half AAA. Um, so the U1, SU2, SU2 anomaly has U1 as the uh, divergence. So for it, TA is 1. Um, but of course, in the coupling in here, TA is also multiplied with the charge, right? The, the charge that couples to, to it. Uh, in particular, so in particular, so I, I have two gauge fields here. So I have to, um, sorry, I have to, no, uh, sorry, I have U1, um, uh, the U1 that comes here is the hypercharge. So TA is one, but one meaning U1 times each charge. So each charge I call YL. And then this thing is proportional to, um, so these are um, the generators of, uh, generators are in SU2, which are Pauli matrices over two. So this whole trace is proportional to uh, trace sigma B sigma C. Okay, which as we know is, delta bc so delta bc comes out and so um i'm left with some of a fermion representations fermion, fermion representations that couples to su2 are called doublets so sum over doublets of hypercharge uh y of with uh, of uh, hypercharge yl so this sum has to be zero so the condition is sum over doublets of YL is supposed to be zero. Now for the purely one anomaly where I have uh, U1 here, U1 here, U1 here. Um, in here, I, I, I also have a charge only. I mean, one times a charge. So trace one is just a number and then um, um, and then, but then I have still uh, a wild charge here, a wild charge here. So all in all, I have wild cube. So I have um, sum over doublets of wild cube, but now uh, this is, um, remember I said this sum over, um, sum over um, chiral fields, but the chiral fields are, uh, left-handed ones with plus and right-handed one with minus, right? That's how we said that the, the SU3 anomaly cancels because the left-handed, the sum of, le of left-handed comes with plus, sum over right-handed comes with minus. Um, so, but now I have also the consistent condition then that sum over left-handed fields YL cubed minus sum over right-handed fields YR cubed is zero. And uh, so we can verify this condition. Um, and well, we can, again, information that is not given here, but we, 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 we should uh, say that the assignment for quarks is YL is one third, Y right uh, of the first component is four thirds, of, so up and y right of the second component, uh, so down is uh, minus a third. <laughs> and uh, from the leptons, um, uh, for the leptons we have yl is minus one, and y right of the f first up component is zero, y 
right of the down component is min minus two. So now we verify the, the conditions for the uh, anomaly in U1 with contributions from SU2 to SU2 is sum over, uh, the condition is uh, sum over doublets while is zero. So there's also, of course, an, um, so doublets are, are um, uh, quark doublets, which of course have also color indices. So I have an MC for some of the MC quarks. Uh, and they have charge one third. And then uh, plus one the, the, for the leptons, one times minus one. So this gives NC over three minus one. So this only cancels for three number of colors as it should. Then for the U1 U1 anomaly with contribution from U1 and U1, again I have uh, left. So for the left part, quarks comes with uh, in NC color. So NC times the the charge. Um, 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 why is the two here? Uh, let me see. Um, well, I oh, sorry, yeah, because. So I have distributions, whereas right-handed, I have to consider them independently. So I have uh, two times charge uh, while for, for, for quarks is one third cubed, and then two for the doublet, uh, doublet um, lepton minus one, so two times minus one cubed minus then quark right and C times quark right uh, gives four thirds for one and minus two thirds for the other. So four thirds cubed and minus two thirds cubed. And then right for, um, for one is zero and for the other one is minus two. So minus two cubed. And then this contribution can be seen to be also uh, zero only for NC equal to three. So we put this here, we do some algebra and we see that is minus two times NC minus three. It only cancels also for three colors as it should be. Um, all right, so, so this is, what happens in the uh, standard model. So the anomal standard model is anomaly free as it should be, but this is very non-trivial, you see, that uh, first of all, we had all of these uh, charge um, uh, assignments for hypercharge. And then uh, on top of it, uh, both conditions imply that we need to have uh, three colors. So extremely non-trivial uh, conditions. And uh, these are, uh, these kind of conditions we can, uh, we should also always uh, put whenever we, um, we, we do some model building. So when we uh, propose, let's say some, uh, some gut theory, some granulified theory, or some um, supersymmetric theory, that should reduce to the standard model at some point. Um, yeah, we should uh, we should both we should imply uh, apply both the uh, condition of um, both the condition of the cancellation of the gauge anomaly, the conditions of the cancellation of the gauge anomaly, which would be very non-trivial, like here for the standard model, and moreover. Uh, also um, 
use the COFS uh, UVIR ma anomaly matching conditions, um, which uh, should match the global anomalies. Uh, so the global anomalies at SANMOL should be equal to the global anomalies uh, of your uh, favorite um, model at high energy. All right, this is everything that I wanted to tell to you today uh, about the applications of the SAM model. And uh, next time, uh, let's see, oh, this is, well, this is a chapter that we'll skip, let's we'll start. Uh, next time, we'll have the operator product expansion. Um, and randomization of composite operators. OK. Um, so do you have any uh, more questions? Uh, I have a question about a previous lecture. About what? A previous lecture. OK. Uh, it's about the exercises. Uh, for lecture 23. For lecture 23. Uh, no, this is 22, sorry. Yeah, it's definitely. Oh, this, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I see. <laughs> I wrote 22, but it's 23, actually, yeah. Um, OK. Uh, I don't understand what this TIR. TIA. Um, so, yeah, so it's, it's, so this definition, so, um, <coughs> yeah, I mean, um, Um, well, so this this is the definition in the so this is a matrix, right? So TIA is a matrix. Is is uh, so T TA. Um, so if in this case we're, I think we're we're looking in in, yeah, in the, the case of vertical force parameters, we're looking at only fields in the adjoint. In the joint, uh, this matrix has uh, also um, um, also uh, indices of the type A. So T A C B is F uh, is I F C uh, A B, right? But um, but uh, there's an index I. That corresponds to the um, to the particle, right? So, so each each particle uh, has uh, each particle is coupled to um, to to such uh, to such a um, such a generator. And then, in particular, in the Feynman diagrams, you, what you obtain is this F, this um, uh, structure constant, right? So, so that's what I mean. So this ti dot tj means sum over a. So this is still a matrix in. Um, in uh, yeah, this is still a, a, a matrix. I mean, each of these is still a matrix. But um, if you explicitly that matrix, you obtain this structure constants F. So if I T I T J would be um, I F C I uh, A B I dot uh, times I F um uh, di dj a uh, 
uh, EJ, right? That's what I mean. What one is CINBI? I'm sorry. One. No, no, th 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 these are. So, so, so this is. So I is the index of the um, particle, right? Yeah. Okay. So, and then C and B are indices of the matrix. I, but the matrix corresponding to the particle, so C, I, B, I. Right. <laughs> Any other question? No? Okay, so uh, then uh, I'll see you on Thursday at nine, talking about uh, operator product expansion and composite operators. Bye.